welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. This episode was supposed to come out around Christmas, but what the heck, it's the holidays and things got a little bit crazy, so Happy New Year, everybody. I hope you all had a great time. Before we start the episode, just one quick announcement. Spotify has started to roll out ratings for podcasts. These are simple one- to five-star ratings like the ones you'll already find on Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts. Now, I have this little tag at the end of every episode asking people to leave a rating or review. Spotify listeners, now's your chance. If you listen to Relevant History on Spotify, click the little dot 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 under the cover art and you'll be able to leave a review. According to Spotify, you have to have completely listened to at least one episode in order to review a show. I guess that's to prevent review bombing. So if you're a brand new listener, you won't be able to leave a rating until after the episode. But for everyone else on Spotify, if you could take a few moments to leave a rating, it could really help the show and get it out to a larger audience. Today's episode is the last of four on the Thirty Years' War, and that is one of the more complicated wars in history. If you're a new listener, you might want to go back and start with episode 36, A Fire in Bohemia, and that'll get you all caught up. Now, let's get on with the show. Where we left off in May of 1643... The war has been going on for 25 years. What began as a conflict between Protestants and Catholics in the Holy Roman Empire has turned into a general European war. In fact, the war's religious aspect was settled almost completely in the 1635 Peace of Prague, where Emperor Ferdinand II agreed to respect the religious freedoms of the Protestant German states, which is what they had wanted all along. But by that point, the war had taken on a momentum of its own, and it was now a great power struggle. On the one side are the powers ruled by the Habsburg dynasty, that is the Holy Roman Empire and the Spanish Empire, and on the other side are the Swedish and the French, with the Dutch providing money as well as being engaged in their own ongoing war with Spain. Now, if this sounds like a mere political war, let's talk about a counterfactual. Let's talk about what might have happened, what the world might have looked like had the Habsburg powers secured a total victory in the Thirty Years' War. This is always fun, right? A little alternative history to spice things up. Here goes. After years of back-and-forth conflict, a Spanish army marches south from the Spanish Netherlands, breaks through the French border defenses, and makes a drive towards Paris. The French scramble to muster a response, but within three weeks their capital has fallen to the Spanish. Following the loss of Paris, French regent Anne of Austria, who is originally a Habsburg, has enough political capital to fire her prime minister, Cardinal Mazarin, who oversaw the failed defense of the city. She replaces him with another cardinal, one friendly to the Spanish, and quickly sues for peace on friendly terms. Formerly Spanish lands north of the Pyrenees are returned to Spain, and France is forced to accede to the Treaty of Tordesillas, so her small New World colonies are also turned over to the Spanish crown. Without French aid, Sweden quickly surrenders to imperial forces and is forced to turn over some of her lands along the Baltic, which are incorporated into a newly invigorated and rapidly centralizing Holy Roman Empire. Now, standing alone against the might of the Spanish Empire, the Dutch Republic is forced to surrender. In the 1660s, the Spanish Inquisition is once again revived in the territory, and leading Protestants are burnt at the stake. Before the death of Louis XIV in France, 
his heir is married to yet another Spanish princess, drawing the countries and their dynasties closer together. By the year 1750, the two kingdoms are ruled as a personal union under the Habsburg dynasty, just as the German Habsburgs rule all of Europe from the Rhine to Lithuania. Instead of Quebec, we have Spanish Canada, and the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War never happen. There's no American Revolution. There is no French Revolution, no Napoleon, and because this Habsburg Empire is so ridiculously powerful, there is no British Empire. Everything in history is different, and it's because one country forced a decisive outcome in the Thirty Years' War. Now, to us modern people, all of this is just a fun mental experiment. And it's something that might have happened had the French been on the losing side of this war and lost badly. But in May of 1643, it looks as if the Spanish Empire might actually pull this off. After years of back-and-forth war, a Spanish army marches south from the Spanish Netherlands, breaks through the French border defenses, and makes a drive toward Paris. This could not come at a worse time for France. The French first minister, Cardinal Richelieu, who had ruled France in all but name for over a decade, has just died, and he has been replaced by his protege, Cardinal Mazarin. Louis XIII has died as well, just a few days earlier, on May 13th, leaving the kingdom to his underage son. Meanwhile, the kingdom is to be run as a regency under Louis's surviving wife, Anne of Austria. At the time, France's armies are having success on two fronts. In the south, they are slowly but steadily pushing the Spanish south through Catalonia, the northeastern part of modern-day Spain. In the east, they are pushing the Spanish out of the Franche Comte, which is France's eastern province on the modern-day Swiss border. To relieve these armies, the French open up a third front along the border with the Spanish Netherlands. And they invade through the Ardennes, which is a wooded, hilly area that would be the target of Hitler's invasion in 1940. The road to Paris will be open if the Spanish can get through to open country, and only one obstacle stands in their way. That is the fortified town of Rocroi. So the Spanish, under the command of seasoned commander Francisco de Mello, lay siege the town. The French rally a response, under the command of Louis de Bourbon, Prince of Condé, who would one day become known as the Great Condé. Condé faces a daunting task. He is the only significant force between the Spanish and the French capital, and his job is to relieve the siege of Rocroix and drive the Spanish back into the Netherlands. But at this time, the French have mostly been successful in the war because their armies are more maneuverable and because of superior siege craft. By contrast, the Spanish have dominated in the open field. In fact, no Spanish army has lost a major battle in the open field for nearly a century at this time. The victories the French have had have either been tactical or they have been sieges. And a big part of why the Spanish are so dominant is what is called the tercio system. Now, the word tercio means third, and it's a reference to how the troops are deployed. A tercio deploys their men in three squares in a staggered formation. So if you picture three squares uh, and the middle square is out towards the front, well, the two side squares will be to the sides. On the other hand, if the middle square is in the back, then the two side squares will be to the front sides, right? And when multiple tercios line up, 
they will form a continuous staggered line of square formations. Right? This line is death to cavalry charges. Right? If the cavalry charge into the front, it's the same as any other frontal charge, right? It's not usually a good idea to charge straight at a bunch of guys with guns and pikes. You usually want to come at them from the sides, but the tercios are squared formations. They're also armed on the sides. And if you do somehow manage to charge into uh, the area between a couple of squares, well, then you're exposed to fire from multiple directions. And this makes the tercio system equally tough on infantry. An enemy might be able to penetrate past the front line, but again, if they do that, they're going to be exposed to fire from multiple directions. Right? These square formations can shoot forwards, sideways, or backwards, so once you're between a few of them, you're in trouble. Basically, any army that is attacking these formations, even if it's successful, it can't really penetrate and if it tries, it's going to find itself surrounded. How does this work? Let's take a look at this tercio system. This system that dominated European warfare for a century. What actually goes into one of these formations? Well, the basic formation uh, consists of a mix of pikemen and arquebusiers. Now, these arquebusiers originally fired arquebuses. Those are really old-fashioned uh, guns that actually had to rest on a on a stick. You had to balance the uh, the muzzle up on a stick because it was so heavy. Nowadays, by the 1640s, uh, these arquebusiers are actually musketmen. Uh, anyway, on paper, the formation consists of 6,000 men each or 2,000 men per square, at least in the early days. Again, in practice, by the 1640s, this number has been halved. Right, so you have 3,000 men in three 1,000-man squares. And the idea of making these formations smaller is that they're a little bit more nimble on the battlefield. It actually makes them more formidable. Now, you guys know I like to play with numbers, so let's take a look at the breakdown of a tercio formation. This information comes from early 20th century British historian Sir Charles Oman's book, A History of the Art of War in the 16th Century. And yes, that's a book about the 1500s, but by the era Oman is describing, the tercios are more or less the same as they are in the 1640s. They don't do a whole lot of evolving once the 1600s roll around. Another thing I should note is that this is not a direct quote. Oman gives the soldiers pay rates as they were listed at the time, which is in Spanish escudos. Those coins contained 6.766 grams of 22 karat gold, which has a current spot price of $53.20 per gram. So, one escudo in 1643 is worth about $360 in December 2021 U.S. dollars. So... I have taken the liberty of converting all the numbers to dollars, which I like to do because it makes things more relevant for a modern audience instead of just talking about some renaissance currency you've never heard of. So, again, this is not an exact quote, but here's how Oman describes the tercios. He says, These heavy corps of over 3,000 men of all ranks were organized as follows. One colonel at $14,400 per month. One major at $7,200 per month. One adjutant at $7,200 per month. One quartermaster at $3,600 per month. One staff captain at $4,320 per month. One lieutenant of the above captain 
at $2,160 per month, one physician at $4,320 per month, one surgeon and one apothecary at $3,600 per month, one chief chaplain at $4,320 per month, one drum major at $3,600 per month, eight halberdiers attached to the colonel each at $1,440 per month. Total of regimental staff, 19 persons, costing $69,840 per month. That is the regimental staff. Then he goes into the strength of the main unit itself. And he says, The 12, sometimes only 10, companies, six of arquebusiers, six of pikemen, or five and five, each consisted of one captain at $5,400 per month, one ensign at $4,320 per month, one sergeant at $3,600 per month, ten corporals at $1,440 per month, one quartermaster at $1,080 per month, 240 privates. The pikemen all had $1,080 but among the arquebusiers, there were extra allowances for distinguished soldiers, which brought some of them up to 1440 per month. One captain's page at 1440 per month. One drummer and one fifer at $1,080 each. One chaplain at 3600 Total in the companies... 3,096 men of all ranks for a 12-company tercio. Cost for a pike company, $293,400 per month. For the arquebusier companies, something more, owing to the extra testoon given to first-class privates, which brought the total to sums varying from 324000 to 342000 per month. Ending the rough quote here, Let's assume we're talking about a full-strength tercio with 12 companies. Combine that with the staff, and you get 3,115 people at a cost of around $400,000 per month in today's money. Before we continue and check out how these guys work in action, let's get Sir Charles Oman's take on this tercio, this time in a direct quote. He continues, quote, there are many points to notice in this table, the first of its kind available. 1. The arquebusier is reckoned more valuable than the pikeman. The premium to the best shots in the company raising their pay to four escudos a month, while no pikeman draws more than three. Point 2. The rank of lieutenant in a company has not yet come into being. It is clear that the single sergeant in each company must have been practically treated as a commissioned officer. But even so, the allowance of officers, only three to a company of 258, is very low. The only lieutenant mentioned is the assistant of the staff captain. Later, under Philip II, every company had a lieutenant who ranked above the Alferez, and also four sergeants, now clearly non-commissioned officers, instead of one. Unquote. So, this is something that has changed since the 1500s. Right now in 1643, you've got a few more men in these formations, junior officers who can help fine-tune the formation's activities out in the field. And they also have more non-commissioned officers, right? senior experienced enlisted men who also provide leadership in the field. They've increased those as well. So you can expect... A tercio in 1643 to be even more nimble and deadly on the battlefield than it was in the 1500s. Continuing with Sir Charles Oman's quote, quote, Point three. The allowance of chaplains is enormous. One chief and twelve company clergy. Thirteen in all to the equivalent of a brigade. In this, as might have been expected, the Spanish army was exceptional. Point four. On the other hand, the medical staff is very moderate. Only three to 3,096 persons. Point five. 
The brigade music runs to a chief and 24 other ranks. The drummers and fifers draw the same pay as a pikeman. The enormous salary of the drum major, ten escudos, is explained by the fact that he was not only a director of music, but a sort of specialist. He is expected not only to teach marches, calls to arms, and calls to retreat, but to be acquainted with the military music of other armies, even the Turkish, so that he can judge the meaning of the sounds heard in the enemy's camp or line of march or battle array and report to the colonel. Unquote. That is something interesting to think about, right? In an era where armies are commanded and led in the field by music, largely. Right? That is how all of those thousands of men oftentimes are getting the orders. They hear a certain call on the trumpet, and that means to go forward. And the drumbeat tells them how fast to move, right? They might hear another trumpet blast that means retreat, or another one that says to change your formation, right? Well, if you have some expert in your army who knows all of the other army's musical commands, that's sort of the Renaissance equivalent of breaking your enemy's radio ciphers in World War II you have a little bit more insight into what they're doing on the battlefield. Anyway, um, against these fearsome tercio formations, the French at Rocroix are using what are then considered more modern tactics, linear formations. These are your classic gunpowder era, uh, three or four ranks of men, marching in a long line and firing in that long line, right? Uh, these formations have a solid front that can deliver devastating firepower. Right? All of its guns are pointed in the same direction. But at the same time, they are more vulnerable to the rear and the flanks. So you're going to use them differently. Now, Besieging Rocroix, the Spanish under de Mello have a force of approximately 27,000, including 19,000 infantry and 8,000 cavalry. On May 18, 1643, they are opposed by a French force of 23,000 under the Prince de Condé. And that force consists of 17,000 infantry to the 19,000 Spanish, and 6,000 cavalry to the 8,000 Spanish. So the Spanish outnumber the French slightly by about 2,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry. But while he is advancing towards Roquois, Condé faces a bigger obstacle. See, the city of Roquois is located on an open plain, but to get there... Right. We're in the Ardennes, we're in this mountainous area. To get there, he has to go through a narrow mountain pass. Condé marches his army forward, willing to risk a rapid attack because he needs to get there quickly if he's going to fight at all. See, there is an imperial army of about 5,000 troops just a few miles to the east. If these troops hook up with DeMello's Spanish, then Condé's slight numeric disadvantage will become far more significant. Another reason Condé decides to attack immediately is because France needs a morale victory. Right? He's just gotten word of Louis XIII's death. It only happened a few days ago. And the future of the government is unclear. But there is a strong anti-war faction amongst the nobility. And anything short of a victory at Rocroix is only going to strengthen that faction's strength. This march through the pass to the open field is very dangerous. It's too narrow for the French cavalry to form up, and their disorganized formations are vulnerable. But de Mello, the Spanish commander, makes a major error. See... 
he could have sent a small force, maybe three or four thousand men, call it three thousand, right? One tercio. Right? He could have sent them forward to bottle up the pass and force a fight with the disorganized French. Slow them down, prevent them from coming onto the main battlefield in good order. Right? Instead, DeMello sits back on the plain in front of the city with his troops formed up and waiting to receive the French attack. In truth, he'd probably love to receive a frontal assault because right, those tercio formations are so rock solid on the defense. Not only that, but if DeMello were to bottle up the pass, Condé might decide to turn his army around and wait for DeMello on the other side, right? If DeMello wants to get to Paris, he's going to have to deal with Condé's army sooner or later. So maybe he's just confident in his superior numbers and is happy to be on the defensive side in this fight. He's comfortable with the ground he's on. And furthermore, keep in mind that this mountain pass Condé is coming through presents another hazard. If the French lose at the Battle of Walcroix, they will have a hard time retreating through such a narrow gap. Condé is likely to lose most of his army if he loses the fight. Anyway, regardless of whatever is going through de Mello's head in this time, by sitting back, he allows the French army to navigate the pass and the French troops start deploying into their formations. And while they are forming up, de Mello sends a message to Jean de Beck, that is, the imperial general east of Rocroix with those 5,000 troops. And de Mello basically says, hey, I'm under attack. Can you send your troops over here and help me out? Now, the battle initially starts out very badly for the French. Right, the first forces through the pass were a large, heavy cavalry unit under the command of General de la Ferte, and de la Ferte is a little bit of a hothead. This unit is supposed to form a screen in front of the main army while they come out of the pass and form up. But instead, around 4 p.m., before the army can form ranks, de la Ferte violates his orders and goes off on his own. He takes his cavalry and he leads an attack against the left side of the Spanish army. Right? He's hoping to sweep around behind them and drive off the Spanish soldiers who are actively engaged in the siege at Roquois, Right, He thinks he can lift the siege right then and there, but the Spanish launch a cavalry counterattack and there are way more Spanish than there are French and uh, De La Ferte is forced to pull back away from the city and rejoin Condé's main army. But even so, this failed charge does manage to serve a purpose. He, while De La Ferte is not screening the main army, so to speak, he does create enough of a distraction that the rest of the French are able to deploy without being harassed. By this point, it is 6 p.m. It's going to be dark soon, and neither side wants to fight right this second. Condé's men have been marching all day, and they're exhausted. DeMello, meanwhile, is happy for any delay that might allow that Imperial Army to come to his assistance. So both sides bed down for the night, but they sleep under the stars in their formation. There is no pitching of tents when you're this close to the enemy. Now, the French left is anchored on a swamp, and it's protected by almost half of the French cavalry under the command of De La Ferte. But the main army in the front, which is where most of the infantry are, consists of two long echelons of infantry formations, right, one behind the other, and there are 15 artillery pieces in front of those lines. Smaller numbers of cavalry and musketeers are stationed behind the main army and act as a reserve. Condé himself commands the troops on the right flank. 
This formation consists of another large detachment of cavalry and a small number of musketeers. And then on their far right, uh, they're anchored against a dense forest. Now, across the field between the French and the city of Roqua, the Spanish have deployed in a similar formation. They have cavalry on the wings and infantry in the center with their cannons out in front. On the infantry line, the front echelon consists of eight tercios, and then the rear echelon, the supporting troops, uh, these are ten battalions of line infantry. They're fighting in a similar formation to the French. And in the night, DeMello takes a thousand of these infantry and he dispatches them into the forest on his far left. Right, that is the same forest that is on the French right. And he wants those 1,000 men to sneak forward through the woods in the night and come up on Condé's right flank and ambush them. Now that we have a little map of the battlefield in our heads, we can commence with the fighting. And the first event of the day, the first event of the main battle, happens in the wee hours of the night. At three in the morning, a Spanish deserter visits the French camp and asks to speak with Condé. He tells him about the Spanish ambush force in the woods and also lets him know that the Imperial Army, right, that 5,000-man force that's coming, he lets Condé know that that Imperial Army is expected to arrive by late morning. In response to this information, Condé does two things. First, he sends out some of his reserve infantry through those woods on his right. Uh, he sends them out in a counter-ambush against DeMello's infantry those 1,000 men that were coming up to sneak up on him. And Condé also decides that if he's going to win, he needs to crush the Spanish army before reinforcements can arrive. So he attacks immediately while it's still dark. He orders the first artillery barrage at four in the morning while the Spanish are still asleep. Now the Spanish quickly rally a response and return fire, but it doesn't really matter because it's still dark and both sides' shots are falling short. They really don't have a good way to aim in the dark. Then, around 5 a.m., under the first dim morning twilight, Condé orders the cavalry on both of his flanks to advance. Now, these cavalry are supposed to move forward in good order, but once again, Delaferte, that hothead commanding the cavalry on the left, well, he goes off looking for glory. And instead of advancing at a walk, which would be the prudent thing to do in dim lighting, he sends his squadrons at the front forward at a gallop. And then because of the poor light... Uh, all of his men quickly become disorganized. They're out of order. They're charging forward in a ragged line, and the rest of the French cavalry on the left flank are doing what they're supposed to do and following at a steady walk. So Delaferte is now way out in front with a handful of disorganized horsemen. The opposing Spanish cavalry, right, the Spanish cavalry lined up opposite them, well, they see an opportunity and trot forward in good order, and they attack De La Ferte's disorganized troops. A large number of French are killed in this attack, and De La Ferte himself is taken captive. The Spanish then continue pressing forward into the rear echelon of French cavalry, right, the ones who had been coming up at a walk. Well, now they're outnumbered, and so they end up retreating away from the battle and into the woods. A handful of Spanish cavalry pursue them to make sure they don't come back, but the main weight of the Spanish cavalry 
on the French left flank, are now able to turn their weight against the French infantry's flank. Right? It is now unprotected by cavalry, and those infantrymen are now being attacked from the side where they're vulnerable. And at the same time, the Spanish infantry from their right flank, right, standing opposite the French left, well, they have come forward and they are now firing on the French as well. So this forces the entire left half of the French front echelon to fall back, right, to get back behind that second line of men. And they suffer a lot of losses in the process. And worse... Uh, the Spanish have actually managed to capture a few of the French cannons. Now it is 6 a.m., and if you're a Vegas bookmaker handicapping this battle, you are giving the French army long odds at this point. But on the Spanish left flank, right opposite the French right, Condé's cavalry and musketeers have moved into position opposite DeMello's cavalry. And unbeknownst to DeMello, about an hour ago, his 1,000-man ambush force in the woods has been annihilated by Condé's counter-ambush. So while DeMello expects to see Condé's cavalry ambushed from the woods, it is he himself who unexpectedly comes under musket fire from the tree line. Even so, the Spanish cavalry to the extreme right hold firm. But there is now a gap between the Spanish cavalry here and the infantry on their main line, and Condé is able to bring some more of his men through the gap between the Spanish cavalry and their infantry tercios in the center. He has now isolated them, and the Spanish left is at risk of collapsing just like the French left. Well, one of the Spanish tercios comes over from the center to try and help out their friends, and DeMello's reserve cavalry also come forward. But when this tercio moves over from the center of the Spanish line to help out their cavalry, it just creates another gap in the line. And remember, Condé had those small number of musketeers with him, well, he sends them up into this gap, once again cutting the Spanish army in two. The ambushing force comes out of the woods on the other side, and suddenly DeMello's cavalry is completely surrounded along with that single tercio. Now, DeMello himself is able to escape along with much of his cavalry. They have horses, they can get out of there, but... The infantry, uh, that tercio, is not so lucky. Uh, without supporting fire from their friends in the main line, they're just completely surrounded by the enemy, and they are killed where they stand. So, now we have a collapse on the French left, at least an imminent collapse, it looks like, and we have the French doing some serious damage on the Spanish left. Just as the Spanish cavalry on the French left had divided, Condé also divides his. And he sends a small force to keep chasing DeMello's cavalry away so they don't come back, and then he turns the main group against the Spanish infantry's left flank, while reforming his musketeers in front. Now, his musketeers are firing against the front of the Spanish tercio formations. They are not charging in. And in this configuration, they have superior firepower. Right? All of their guns are facing the same way, while the Spanish muskets are facing all kinds of directions. And because the French musketeers hang back and don't charge in, they're able to continue inflicting disproportionate casualties against the Spanish. Now, Condé's cavalry charges into the second echelon of Spanish infantry, right? They ignore the tercios in the front, and they charge into the side of the units that are in a linear formation. Again, these formations are weak on their sides, 
so the French charge just cuts clear through to the center of the Spanish army. But meanwhile, back at the main French line, Condé's sub-commanders have brought their infantry reserves forward to shore up the collapsing left flank. This stabilizes the line and stops the Spanish from pressing through. At the same time, the Spanish cavalry could still charge around and flank the French. But for whatever reason, they continue with a frontal assault which isn't as effective. And while they're doing this, the French cavalry reserve swings all the way around the right side of the French line, and then, along with the musketeers from that right half of the line, they form one long line and they swing around like a closing door, and they smash into the side of the attacking Spanish. Along with the troops who were already on the French left, they steadily push the Spanish backwards, retake their lost cannons, and then keep slowly pressing the Spanish further back towards the main Spanish line. But things are about to get even worse for the Spanish. Some of the French cavalry who had retreated back into the woods turn back around, and they come in from the far side of the French left. Once again, a portion of the Spanish army is surrounded on three sides. Right, now, these forces actually maintain their cohesion, and they continue to fall back in good order towards the main Spanish line to join up with their friends. By now, it's 8 a.m. Condé's cavalry have swung all the way around from the French right and around through the back half of the main Spanish army, and the entire rear Spanish infantry echelon, they're either dead or retreating, and Condé's men have made a full circle around the enemy. At this point, he orders them to ignore the main Spanish line of tercios, who are still engaged with those French musketeers on the right flank, and instead he goes past them and charges back towards his own line, towards the rear of those retreating Spanish forces. And suddenly this force, which had been engaged in that orderly tactical withdrawal, well, they're surrounded on all sides. And almost the entire force is killed or captured within a matter of minutes. Now, at this point, the five remaining Spanish tercios remaining from their main line still have a chance to retreat, right? That's 15,000 men, plus a, a good number of cavalry and some stragglers from the other units, right? That's a good portion of the army that can still be salvaged. But the new Spanish commander, right, de Mello's sub-commander, uh, Paul Bernard de Fontaine, uh, he still expects Jean de Beck's imperial troops to arrive any minute now. Right? Those guys who are off to the west who de Mello had asked for help. But what de Fontaine doesn't know is that Beck thinks everything is fine and that de Mello was just panicking. So instead of hurrying to get his army over to help his Spanish allies, he's taking his sweet time and his imperials haven't even broken camp yet. Trying to buy time for the Imperials to arrive, de Fontaine has his tercios fall back and form squares along with the rest of the surviving Spaniards. Over the next 30 minutes, Condé reforms the French army. He takes a break, redeploys, and he's got his infantry in the center and most of his cavalry on the right and there's a small defensive force of cavalry hanging back on the left side in case any more Spanish show up. And this newly formed up French army marches forward. They capture the Spanish artillery, and uh, being superior in number at this point, they surround the Spanish tercio squares on three sides. Right? They have infantry on the front and left, and Condé's cavalry on the right. 
And now the French bring their own cannons forward, and along with the captured Spanish guns, they hammer mercilessly at the Tercio squares. And while this is going on, the French cavalry force on the left, those guys who are just looking out for any more Spanish, well, they see an opportunity with the entire Spanish army occupied, and they charge forward to the walls of Roquois, and they drive off the small Spanish detachment that had been maintaining the siege. The city is saved, and by now... More French musketeers have marched all the way around the Spanish tercios, surrounding them completely and further eroding their numbers. The short-time Spanish commander Paul Bernard de Fontaine is among the dead, and now the Spanish are on their third commander of the day. Recognizing that the situation is hopeless, this new commander immediately sends a message to Condé with an offer of surrender. When he receives the offer, Condé marches forward with his personal cavalry guard, intending to meet with the Spanish general and negotiate terms. But some of the Spanish troops are unaware that there's a surrender in the works, and when they see advancing French cavalry, they open fire. Condé pulls back, and believing that this was a Spanish trick... Instead of a mistake, he orders a renewed assault. The French cannons open fire on the Spanish at point-blank range, tearing through rank after rank of helpless men. Musketeers attack from three sides and the cavalry from the right, and the Spanish soldiers, who were already running out of ammo, have no hope of making a stand. At the end of the day, the Spanish army of 27,000 has lost approximately 8,000 casualties, as well as 7,000 men and all of their cannons captured. Almost all of these losses were infantry. Out of the approximately 15,000 men in the Spanish center, fewer than 2,000 make the march back to the Spanish Netherlands. French losses are much lower with only 4,000 men killed or wounded out of Condé's initial 23,000-man force. Now, in and of itself, the Battle of Roquois is just one chapter in a long back-and-forth conflict along all of France's borders. But it's historically significant for a few reasons. For one thing, it shatters the myth of the Spanish Tercio's invincibility. This probably isn't fair, since the Tercios themselves fought well. They just couldn't stand alone on their own after the French cavalry had destroyed most of the rest of the army. But in warfare, an army's reputation can be every bit as important as its paper strength. If people think your armies can't be beaten, they will hesitate to engage. You can march around with a little bit more impunity. You can achieve some military successes without even fighting. And after the Battle of Roquois, other armies are less hesitant to take on the Tercios, and the Spanish will have to fight harder for any strategic gains. Secondly, the French victory at Roquois quiets talks of peace among the French nobility. And in particular, it allows pro-war ministers like the first minister, Cardinal Mazarin, to stay in their positions, guiding French national policy during the next phase of the war. Thirdly, the battle establishes the reputation of the Prince de Condé, who will afterwards become known as the Great Condé. He will become a major military leader for France up until the end of the war. However, he will also clash frequently with Cardinal Mazarin about the war's overall direction. Most importantly, though, the Battle of Roquois brings the new Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand III to the bargaining table. While imperial troops were not directly involved in the battle, 
The Empire itself is so weakened by war that it's no match for the combined might of France and Sweden. And with his Spanish allies no longer looking quite so invincible, Ferdinand wants to make peace. And so, the war might have come to an end in 1643. But this is the Thirty Years' War, not the Twenty-Five Years' War, and the fates still have a hand to play. Two things happen before the end of the year 1643 that cause the peace talks to break down. But I'm going to talk about them out of order, because one of them is simple and one of them is complicated. So let's talk about the simple thing first. The second thing, chronologically, that causes peace talks to break down is the Battle of Tutlingen, or Dutlingen if you prefer. In the early winter, a French army under the command of Condé has crossed the Rhine, the river between France and Germany, and he has pillaged a few small towns and set up a winter camp in the village of Tutlingen. In response to this incursion, Emperor Ferdinand sends a counterattack, which takes the French completely by surprise. 19th century historian Alexander Morrison describes this event in his book, The Thirty Years' War. He says, quote, The attack was made on a side where it was least looked for, on account of the woods and narrow passes, and a heavy snowstorm which fell upon the same day the 24th of November, 1643, concealed the approach of the vanguard until it halted before Dudlingen. The whole of the artillery without the place, as well as the neighboring castle of Hamburg, were taken without resistance. Dudlingen itself was gradually surrounded by the enemy, and all connection with the other quarters in the adjacent villages silently and suddenly cut off. The French were vanquished without firing a cannon, The cavalry owed their escape to the swiftness of their horses, and the few minutes in advance which they had gained upon their pursuers. The infantry were cut to pieces, or voluntarily laid down their arms. About 2,000 men were killed, and 7,000, with 25 staff officers and 90 captains, taken prisoner. Unquote. Inside of France the royal court suppresses news of this debacle in a move that Cardinal Richelieu would have been proud of. But Emperor Ferdinand and the rest of the Imperials know about it, and it gives them hope. Now, the other, probably more important reason that peace talks break down in 1643 is that Christian IV, the king of Denmark-Norway, once again decides to get in on the action. Earlier in the war, he had involved himself militarily on the Protestant side, gotten spanked by the Imperials, and sued for peace. This time he decides to profit indirectly. See, there are massive shipments being sent from the French and other powers to the Swedish and to get from the Atlantic to Swedish ports in the Baltic, these ships have to pass through the Danish Straits, which means they have to pay a toll called the Sound Dues to Denmark. Well, in summer of 1643, Christian raises the Sound Dues in a shameless act of war profiteering. But Christian IV is also one of the mediators in the peace talks with the Holy Roman Empire and Sweden and Denmark-Norway are historic rivals. Justified or not, the Swedes believe that Christian is mediating in bad faith and that the increase in the sound dues is just another roundabout way of weakening Sweden. The Swedish secretly decide that they have military superiority and that it's time to go to war against the Danish. Their army in northern Germany, under the command of General Lennart Tortensen, suddenly starts marching west, away from the main theater of operations. It's impossible to guess Tortensen's ultimate goal because he keeps zigzagging. The Imperials are perplexed, and 
not even the French have any idea what their allies are up to. And then, on December 12, 1643, Tortensen's army marches into the Duchy of Holstein, which is the Baltic province of the Holy Roman Empire, which is ruled by Christian IV. This causes Ferdinand III to formally end all peace talks, because again, the Duchy of Holstein is part of the empire, and there's no point continuing peace talks with Sweden if they're still going to be fighting against Christian IV in his role as the Duke of Holstein. Part of the emperor's job is to defend the empire, and so he can't make peace with somebody who's at war with one of his subjects. And all of this because Christian IV decided to raise the sound dues. So yeah, the Byzantine politics of the Holy Roman Empire once again come back to bite them. Anyway, Tortensen marches through Holstein and then through Jutland without meeting any significant military resistance. If you picture the Baltic Sea, right, it's separated from the Atlantic by two peninsulas on the west side. We all know Scandinavia. It's the large peninsula that comes down from the northeast, while Jutland is the smaller peninsula that comes up the southwest. And then there are some islands between them. Well, Tortensen has now made himself master of that entire southwestern peninsula. At the same time, another Swedish army under the command of Gustav Horn attacks Danish holdings in Scandinavia, conquering chunks of Norway. Now, Christian IV tries to stabilize things by hunkering down on the Danish home islands, building up his fleet and waiting for the emperor to help. Ferdinand III tries. He sends an army north to retake Holstein and some of Denmark's other territories in northern Germany. This would isolate Tortensen's army in Jutland and cut him off from supplies and then force him to either surrender or try to fight his way back into Germany. But the Imperial Army is never able to completely cut Tortensen off. He's able to keep getting supplies, and he is very comfortable in Jutland. At the same time, Christian IV's fleet suffers some setbacks. After Denmark scores a major victory against the Swedes in July of 1644, a naval victory, the Swedes attack their home islands again, this time with Dutch assistance. In October of 1644, Denmark suffers a major naval defeat at the Battle of Famarn, and Christian IV himself is blinded in one eye when a cannonball strikes his ship and sends splintered wood flying everywhere. With most of his navy destroyed, it is now Christian who is cut off, stuck on the Danish home islands and isolated from his armies in Norway, which, by the way, are holding their own, but they aren't able to actually get any advantage over the Swedes. Christian sues for peace, and a treaty is signed in August of 1645. Ultimately, Sweden gets to take the large Baltic Sea island of Gotland, which remains Swedish today. They get to take the smaller island of Osel, which is now part of Estonia, and they also get some land along the Norwegian border. But most importantly, the peace treaty makes Sweden exempt from those hated sound dues so they don't have to pay extra taxes on their war supplies. Now, this whole affair with Denmark and Sweden is such a big deal that even though it's part of the Thirty Years' War, historians have given it its own name, Tortensen's War. So, hats off to General Tortensen, who did such a fantastic job that he managed to get a whole war named after him. But what has happened is that the Thirty Years' War has now been extended by two more years. Once more, Ferdinand III tries to resume peace talks, but Tortensen is already on the march again. 
this time into the Protestant heartland of Saxony in northern Germany. After a series of imperial defeats by French and Swedish forces, Elector John George of Saxony makes a separate peace with the Swedes in September of 1645. Part of the empire is now out of the war. The next year, the French move in on Elector Maximilian of Bavaria to force him to do the same. Bavaria is in the southern part of Germany, just northwest of Austria, and it is a largely Catholic duchy. More importantly, Maximilian of Bavaria has been around on the emperor's side of the war since the very beginning. As you may remember, back in 1623, Ferdinand's father, Ferdinand II, had rewarded Maximilian's loyalty by giving him the title of Elector Palatine, and this had thrown the empire's internal politics out of whack and turned a five-year civil war into a 30-year international war. After all that he has caused, Maximilian is now about to be on the uglier end of a fight. The French army now moving towards Bavaria is commanded by the Viscount of Turenne, an accomplished general who had now become Marshal of France. He's no fan of Cardinal Mazarin's, and Mazarin had actually had him fired, but after the French disaster at the Battle of Tutlingen, the cardinal was forced to relent and call him back into service. In his book, The Thirty Years' War, 19th century American ambassador, author, and historian Samuel Gardner writes about Turenne's campaign. He says, quote, Turenne, for the first time at the head of a superior force, was about to teach the world a lesson in the art of war. Whilst the enemy was preparing for the expected attack by entrenching his position, the united French and Swedish armies slipped past them and marched straight for the heart of Bavaria, where an enemy had not been seen since Bernard had been chased out in 1643. That one day, as Turenne truly said, altered the whole face of affairs. Everywhere the roads were open. Provisions were plentiful. The population was in the enjoyment of the blessings of peace. Turenne and Wrangel crossed the Danube without difficulty. Schorndorf, Wurzburg, Nordlingen, Donauwörth made no resistance to them. But there was no unanimity in the councils of the enemy. The Bavarian generals wanted to defend Bavaria. The imperialist generals wanted to defend the still remaining Austrian possessions in Swabia. The invaders were allowed to accomplish their purpose. They arrived at the gates of Munich before the citizens knew what had become of their master's army. With grim purpose, Turenne and Wrangel set themselves to make desolate the Bavarian plain, so that it might be rendered incapable of supporting a Bavarian army. Maximilian was reduced to straits such as he had not known since the time when Tilly fell at the passage of the Lech. Sorely against his will, he signed, in May 1647, a separate truce with the enemy. The truce did not last long. In September, Maximilian was once more on the emperor's side. Bavaria paid dearly for the elector's defection. All that had been spared a year before fell a sacrifice to new devastation. The last great battle of the war was fought at Süßmarschhausen on May 17, 1648. The Bavarians were defeated, and the work of the destroyer went on yet for a while unchecked. Unquote. Gardner is forgetting one more major battle, which we'll get to in a second, but regardless, the Elector of Bavaria, the Emperor's only major remaining ally inside the Empire, has been forced out of the war. This leaves the Habsburg Emperor with only one remaining ally, Spain. By now, by the time the electorate of Bavaria has surrendered. This is over two and a half years after Tortensen forced elector John George of Saxony out of the war. What has been going on in his neck of the woods? Well, Torstensen's armies have rolled across Bohemia, 
pillaging that unlucky country yet another time in this unending catastrophe. And then, moving past Bohemia, they even press into Austria and set up camp outside the imperial capital at Vienna. Meanwhile, George Rakowski, the Prince of Transylvania and the son of Bethlen Gabor, who we met earlier in our story, uh, Rakowski has invaded Hungary, which is another one of Emperor Ferdinand's personal kingdoms, much like Bohemia. Now, Ferdinand eventually pays Rakowski off and gets him out of Hungary, and constant unrest in Bohemia forces the Swedish to pull back from the Austrian heartland and back to that country, but it's obvious at this point that the emperor's position can only continue to weaken. And this leaves Spain as the only serious player left on what we used to call the Catholic side of the war, but which has now become just the Habsburg side. That said, there's still reason for the Habsburgs to be optimistic. In January of 1648, Spain and the Dutch Republic signed the Peace of Munster. This agreement formally ended the Eighty Years' War between the Dutch and the Spanish, who formally recognized Dutch independence once and for all. The Dutch people are tired of war. They're a republic. The only reason they were even fighting the Spanish was to gain independence. Now that they have their independence and their peace, there is little chance of them helping the French and the Swedish. While their withdrawal from the war leaves Spain free to turn all its focus against France. Well, not all its focus. Portugal is fighting a war of independence, and there is a French-backed rebellion in Catalonia, but remember, the Spanish Empire is what we would now call a superpower. They're capable of fighting more than one war simultaneously, and France, while a powerful nation, is still not considered to be quite that powerful. The empire doesn't have time for a long protracted war, though. They've already had one. At this point, Emperor Ferdinand just wants to make peace. And the best he can hope for is that the Spanish score a major victory or two in the meantime. Or that Poland decides to attack Sweden again, or fate intervenes in some other way. But none of those things are going to happen. In fact... On August 20th, 1648, during the final days of the war, the Spanish suffer one of their worst defeats of the conflict at the Battle of Lens. That is spelled L-E-N-S, like the English word lens. Uh, the Spanish army in this battle is led by Archduke Leopold Wilhelm, who is the governor of the Spanish Netherlands. With no more Dutch to fight, he turns southwest into France, and he begins conquering smaller cities in the general area around Dunkirk in northern France. On August 17th, his army arrives outside the city of Lens and begins to lay siege. The city is only lightly defended, and it's expected to fall quickly. In the afternoon a French relief army commanded by our friend the Prince de Condé is seen approaching from the north. Archduke Leopold redeploys most of his army on a tall ridge to the west of the city, leaving a small detachment to continue the siege. This gives the Spanish the high ground, and Condé's army can't reach Nau without walking under the fire of their cannon. The two forces are more or less evenly matched. Uh, the Spanish and French both have around 9,000 cavalry, while the Archduke has a slight edge in infantry, about 9,000 to Condé's 7,000, if you include the Spanish troops who are actively besieging law and not just the ones on the hilltop. The Spanish also have more artillery than the French, at 38 guns to 18, although I should point out that the French guns are a newer model and a little bit more effective, so that's not quite as much of a discrepancy as it might seem. Now, 
Conde is understandably eager to relieve the city of law, but given the superior Spanish position, a direct assault would be suicide. Instead, on the morning of August 18th, he deploys his men across the open plain north of the city, just outside the range of the Spanish cannons. He is hoping to lure the Spanish into an attack and draw them off the high ground. But the Archduke doesn't take the bait. Instead, he just sits up on his hill with the bulk of his army while his smaller detachment of men continues with the siege. And this continues all day and then continues into the 19th. And later on the 19th, the garrison of Law surrenders. Nay. Small Spanish detachment occupies the city, and the rest of the besieging force rejoins Leopold's main army up on the hill. Now, Condé's French army had made a forced march just to reach Lens on time, and they're short on food. And now that the city's taken, there's no point in staying and forcing a battle. So, Early on the morning of November 20th, Condé orders his men to withdraw north to the French-held city of La Basse. There might not have been any major battle at all this day, except for the fact that Jean de Beck is present. If you don't remember him, that's because he's been a minor player in our story. He is the imperial general that was supposed to send reinforcements to help the Spanish at Roquois but never did. Well, he's eager for revenge, or some might say redemption. And inside Archduke Leopold's command tent, he urges the Spanish commander to attack the retreating French. Leopold agrees, then promptly leaves Beck in command of the army and rides away from the battlefield. Maybe... He does not think this is a good idea and wants to avoid responsibility, who knows, but now that Beck is in charge, he immediately sends a force of cavalry after the French, trying to harass them while he forms up the rest of the Spanish army to follow after. This Spanish cavalry is actually a little bit more successful than Beck had anticipated. It catches up with the French rearguard, which is also cavalry, and taken by surprise, this French rearguard is driven off, and the Spanish cavalry continue marching forward, and they end up penetrating into Condé's personal guard. Condé himself is almost captured before the Spanish can be repulsed. Realizing that the Spanish are now in hot pursuit and that his retreating army is vulnerable, Condé orders his men to form up for battle turns them around, and faces the Spanish. It's at this point that Beck makes his first mistake of the day. While he had spent the entire Battle of Roquois dilly-dallying, at Long he makes the opposite error and he gets too aggressive. In his rush to attack the French, he's forced to leave his slow-moving artillery on top of the ridge, where they will end up being out of range of the battle. So, right from the outset, Beck gives up his advantage in artillery. Meanwhile, the French cannons are able to bombard his army the entire time they're making their assault. Beck's second mistake is that he lets his troops get out of order. Both armies are formed up similarly with infantry in the center and cavalry on the wings, but when you're marching in formation, you don't want to move too quickly. The faster you're going, the harder it is for all your guys to stay in a neat line, and the Spanish are moving so quickly that their line gets ragged. This is a sloppy attack. On the other side of the battlefield, Condé takes his time. He moves his men slowly into position and has them stop periodically to dress their ranks. He's in no hurry to advance, so the French troops are formed up in tight disciplined ranks, ready to deliver a proper volley of fire. And as his men are deploying, Condé gives a short speech. He says, quote, Friends, do you remember Roquois, Fribourg, 
Nordlingen, we must win or die. You will walk in one line. You will retain your order of battle no matter what. Unquote. And even though he takes his time forming up, because his men are better positioned, Condé is actually able to attack first. He personally leads a cavalry charge against the disorganized cavalry on the Spanish left flank and drives them away. Meanwhile, the French cavalry on the other side does the same to the cavalry on the Spanish right. Both forces not only drive off the cavalry, they keep pushing forward and penetrate so far behind the main Spanish line that they end up linking up behind the ridge where Beck has left all his artillery. Condé then orders all of these cavalry to turn around and charge up the hill, and he captures the Spanish cannons. So it's already only 9.30 in the morning, and Beck has managed to lose his artillery and most of his cavalry. But to his credit... His aggression has paid off on the main line of battle, where his infantry, along with the remaining Spanish cavalry, have slowly been pushing the French infantry back. As a matter of fact, they've even pushed the French back far enough that now the French artillery are in Spanish hands. But the French are able to eventually stabilize their lines, and... This is right around the same time that the Spanish officers notice that Condé's cavalry is about to attack them in the rear. The remaining Spanish cavalry and a few lucky infantrymen manage to escape being encircled, but everyone else is soon trapped between the French infantry on the north side and the French cavalry on the south. Completely surrounded, Beck is forced to surrender. Beck himself is badly wounded in the final minutes of the fighting, and he dies of his wounds ten days later. This crushing defeat leaves the Spanish Netherlands completely exposed to Condé's army. However, events in Paris would prevent Condé from exploiting his victory. After years of arguments over heavy war taxes, First Minister Cardinal Mazarin has had the heads of the parliaments arrested. Riots break out in Paris, sowing the seeds of a wider rebellion, and this complicates military operations. But despite this, the Battle of Law makes it clear to Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand III that the war will not be over any time soon. No Spanish aid is immediately forthcoming so he agrees to most French and Swedish peace demands. And in November of 1648, representatives from the three nations and their allies signed the Treaty of Munster and the Treaty of Osnabrück, which we now collectively call the Peace of Westphalia. This treaty makes peace between the Empire and their allies, Sweden and their allies, and France and their allies. Spain has no part in the treaty, since Spain has never actively been at war against Sweden, and the Franco-Spanish War is considered a separate affair. For such a long, violent struggle, the Thirty Years' War does not result in many territorial changes. Most of the treaty deals with various small bishoprics and whether they're going to be Protestant or Catholic. France gains a little bit of territory along her eastern frontier, and Sweden gets some territory along the Baltic coast. Sweden also gets two important bishoprics, Bremen and Verden, which means that Sweden, like Denmark-Norway, now has a seat in the imperial diet. And in an unrelated matter, the treaty also establishes the right of customs-free navigation along the River Rhine. The emperor agrees to formally recognize the Dutch Republic and formally removes their territories from the empire. Now, this had been de facto true for generations, but now it is legally true. And the same is the case for the Swiss Confederacy, which we haven't talked about at all, but which 
like the Netherlands, has been de facto independent for some time. But the biggest change to happen as the result of the Peace of Westphalia is the recognition of religious liberty. Once again, in the Holy Roman Empire, the duke, count, or the other ruler of a state will determine the state's official religion. This has been done before, and it's only led to more conflict. But this time, things are going to be different. France and Sweden, that's one Catholic external power and one Protestant power, they are going to be made the official guarantors of the peace. Not only that, but in addition to recognizing Lutheranism, Calvinism is also now an accepted religion in the empire, which reflects Germany's growing religious diversity. Finally, private individuals are no longer required to follow the official religion in their state. As long as they do so in private or during limited public hours, subjects of any imperial state may follow whatever kind of Christianity they like. Jews are also welcome, although they have no part in the treaty, and many European Jews continue to flock to the even more tolerant Dutch Republic. Beyond its immediate political impact, the Peace of Westphalia has profound implications on how Europeans conceptualize the legitimacy of political power. By this I mean that it marks the transition away from a period of European dynastic rule under the ultimate supervision of the Pope. This is the world Emperor Ferdinand II had been fighting for at the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. Instead, it's as if the ghost of Cardinal Richelieu himself had written the treaty. And we now see the beginning of a European political order based not on religion or family connections, but on national self-determination. I'm not a big fan of Henry Kissinger, but in his book Diplomacy, He captures this transition beautifully and describes the conflict of these two ideas. He writes, quote, Richelieu derived little comfort from the fact that Spain and Austria shared France's Catholic faith. Quite to the contrary, a victory for the Counter-Reformation was exactly what Richelieu was determined to prevent. In pursuit of what would today be called a national security interest, and was then labeled for the first time raison d'etat, Richelieu was prepared to side with the Protestant princes and exploit the schism within the universal church. Had the Habsburg emperors played according to the same rules or understood the emerging world of raison d'etat, they would have seen how well placed they were to achieve what Richelieu feared most— the preeminence of Austria and the emergence of the Holy Roman Empire as the dominant power on the continent. Through the centuries, however, the enemies of the Habsburgs benefited from the dynasty's rigidity in adjusting to tactical necessities or understanding future trends. The Habsburg rulers were men of principle. They never compromised their convictions except in defeat. At the start of this political odyssey, therefore, they were quite defenseless against the ruthless cardinal's machinations. Emperor Ferdinand II, Richelieu's foil, had almost certainly never heard of raison d'etat. Even if he had, he would have rejected it as blasphemy, for he saw his secular mission as carrying out the will of God, and always stressed the holy in his title as Holy Roman Emperor. Never would he have conceded that divine ends could be achieved by less than moral means, Never would he have thought of concluding treaties with the Protestant Swedes or the Muslim Turks, measures which the cardinal pursued as a matter of course. Ferdinand's advisor, the Jesuit Lemormani, thus summarized the emperor's outlook. And this is a quote within a quote. The false and corrupt policies, which are widespread in these times, he in his wisdom condemned from the start. He held that those who followed such policies could not be dealt with, since they practice a falsehood and misuse God and religion. 
it would be a great folly for one to try and strengthen a kingdom which God alone has granted, which means that God hates. End of the quote within a quote. A ruler committed to such absolute values found it impossible to compromise, let alone to manipulate his bargaining position. In 1596, while still an archduke, Ferdinand declared, I would rather die than grant any concessions to the sectarians when it comes to religion. To the detriment of his empire, he certainly lived up to his words. Since he was less concerned with the empire's welfare than with obeisance to the will of God, he considered himself duty-bound to crush Protestantism, even though some accommodation with it clearly would have been in his best interests. In modern terms, he was a fanatic. The words of one of the imperial advisors, Kaskar Scacopius, highlight the emperor's beliefs. Another quote within a quote, Woe to the king who ignores the voice of God beseeching him to kill the heretics. You should not wage war for yourself, but for God. Bellum non tuum sed de esse statuas. End of the quote within a quote. For Ferdinand, the state existed in order to reserve religion, not vice versa. In matters of state, he said, which are so important for our holy confession, one cannot always take into account human considerations. Rather, he must hope in God and only trust in him. Richelieu treated Ferdinand's faith as a strategic challenge. Though privately religious, he viewed his duties as a minister in entirely secular terms. Salvation might be his personal objective, but to Richelieu the statesman, it was irrelevant. Man is immortal, his salvation is hereafter, he once said. The state has no immortality. Its salvation is now or never. In other words, states do not receive credit in any world for doing what is right. They are only rewarded for being strong enough to do what is necessary. End quote. And a little later on, Kissinger concludes, quote, The gods often punish man by fulfilling his wishes too completely. The cardinal's analysis that success of the Counter-Reformation would reduce France to an appendage of an increasingly centralized Holy Roman Empire was almost certainly correct, especially if one assumed, as he must have done, that the age of the nation-state had arrived. But whereas the nemesis of Wilsonian idealism is the gap between its professions and reality, the nemesis of raison d'etat is overextension, except in the hands of a master, and it probably is even then. For Richelieu's concept of raison d'etat had no built-in limitations. How far would one go before the interests of the state were deemed satisfied? How many wars were needed to achieve security? Wilsonian idealism, proclaiming a selfless policy, is possessed of the constant danger of neglecting the interests of state. Richelieu's raison d'etat threatens self-destructive tours de force. That is what happened to France after Louis XIV assumed the throne. Richelieu had bequeathed to the French kings a preponderantly strong state with a weak and divided Germany and a decadent Spain on its borders. But Louis XIV gained no peace of mind from security. He saw in it an opportunity for conquest. In his overzealous pursuit of raison d'etat, Louis XIV alarmed the rest of Europe and brought together an anti-French coalition which, in the end, thwarted his design. Nevertheless, for 200 years after Richelieu, France was the most influential country in Europe and has remained a major factor in international politics to this day. Few statesmen of any country can claim an equal achievement. Still, Richelieu's greatest successes occurred when he was the only statesman to jettison the moral and religious restraints of the medieval period. Inevitably, Richelieu's successors inherited the task of managing a system in which most states were operating from his premises. Thereby, France lost the advantage of having adversaries constrained by moral considerations as Ferdinand had been in the time of Richelieu. Once all states played by the same rules, gains became much more difficult to achieve. For all the glory raison d'etat brought France, it amounted to a treadmill a never-ending effort to push France's boundaries outward, to become the arbiter of the conflicts among the German states, and thereby to dominate Central Europe 
until France was drained by the effort and progressively lost the ability to shape Europe according to its design. Raison d'état provided a rationale for the behavior of individual states, but it supplied no answer to the challenge of world order. Raison d'état can lead to a quest for primacy or to establishment of equilibrium, but rarely does equilibrium emerge from the conscious design. Usually, it results from the process of thwarting a particular country's attempt to dominate, as the European balance of power emerged from the effort to contain France. End quote. What Kissinger is talking about here, this politics of national interest that he calls raison d'etat, goes hand in hand with the concept of Westphalian sovereignty. Westphalian sovereignty means that all states, big and small, have sole authority over the laws within their borders and that other states do not have the right to interfere. This is not spelled out in the Peace of Westphalia, but it has its roots there in the affirmation of religious liberty for princes of the Holy Roman Empire. This is more a matter of political philosophy than anything else, but political philosophy is important because it informs how our systems work. It changes which government actions people perceive as legitimate and which actions will cause people to riot. And here we see a major philosophical shift in how political sovereignty is understood. Right? The emperor, at least in theory, obtains his authority from God when he is crowned by the pope, but even he does not have the right to interfere in the German state's internal religious affairs. Conspiracy theorists and starry-eyed idealists alike like to talk about the idea of a new world order, as if that's something revolutionary. But we get new world orders all the time, and this is one of them. This is as big a moment as the end of World War I or the fall of the Berlin Wall. Of course... Ideas as big as nationalism and national sovereignty don't just appear in the blink of an eye. They take shape over time. And if you'd asked most of the participants in the Peace of Westphalia whether they had just fundamentally changed the rules of international relations, they would have said no. But the treaty is a big, flashing road sign on the highway of history. It tells us that change is happening, and that we have entered finally into the era of the modern nation-state. This year, 1648, is when words like nationalism and nationalist first become coherent in something resembling the modern sense. Now, with all of that being said, the Peace of Westphalia often gets blown out of proportion. For one thing, the concept of Westphalian sovereignty as established in the treaty has nothing to do with states outside the Holy Roman Empire. Right? This is not some official statement of a universal principle. Right, this applies only to the status of states inside the empire. Not only that, but even that sovereignty is limited. But it's notable how much freedom the different states do acquire, particularly in the realm of foreign policy. Part of the treaty spells out these freedoms explicitly. It reads, quote, to prevent for the future any differences arising in political matters, all and every one of the electors, princes, and estates of the Holy Roman Empire are so established and confirmed in their ancient rights, prerogatives, liberties, privileges, free exercise of territorial right both in ecclesiastical and in political matters, in their lordships and sovereign rights, by virtue of this present transaction." 
that they never can or ought to be molested therein by any whomsoever upon any matter of pretense. They shall enjoy without contradiction the right of suffrage in all deliberations touching the affairs of the empire, especially when the business in hand involves the making or interpreting of laws, declaring wars, imposing taxes, levying or quartering soldiers, erecting new fortifications in the territories of the estates, or reinforcing the old garrisons. As also, when a peace of alliance is to be concluded and the like, in these and other things, nothing shall be acted in the future except by the common free choice and consent of all the estates of the empire. Above all, it shall be free perpetually to each of the estates of the empire to make alliances with strangers for their preservation and safety, provided, nevertheless, such alliances be not against the emperor and the empire, nor against the public peace. And this treaty, and without prejudice to the oath by which every one is bound to the emperor and the empire. End quote. This last bit is important. See, while the states of the Holy Roman Empire aren't allowed to go to war or make an alliance against the emperor, there's nothing preventing them from making all kinds of wars without his approval, including making alliances on the opposite sides from each other. Right? This will eventually lead to the centralization of power in Prussia, the breakup of the HRE, and the formation of modern Germany later on in the 19th century. More importantly and more broadly, this idea of state sovereignty will begin to take root outside the empire's borders. Rather than simply being the possessions of one royal family or another, nation-states themselves will come to be seen as the cornerstone of the international order. Today, no matter where you are in the world, unless you're on Antarctica or something, the highest legal authority is the national government of whatever country you're in. Cardinal Richelieu's policies have lived on in France and have finally led to the weakening of Habsburg Austria. But the war against Spain still goes on. It will continue after the Thirty Years' War for another 11 years until ending in the 1659 Treaty of the Pyrenees, which is, by the way, another great victory for France. During part of this time, from the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648 to 1653, the riots in Paris turn into a wider rebellion, as first the people and then the nobles rebel against King Louis XIV in a series of domestic conflicts known as the Fronde. This French civil conflict gives Spain time to recover from the Battle of Long, or the Franco-Spanish War would probably have ended much sooner with even worse losses for the Spanish. The Prince de Condé, who was the hero of the battles of Roquois and Long, is a major rebel leader in the Fronde. Remember, he and Cardinal Mazarin have never gotten along. And so, when his rebel army is defeated in the field, he ends up being forced into exile in Spain. Eventually, he returns and is forced to kneel and beg for the teenaged king's pardon. Young Louis XIV grants this pardon, allowing Condé to live as an example of how even the greatest national heroes submitted to their new king. By the end of this period, Louis stands unopposed as France's absolute ruler. No parliament or nobles can shine a candle to his power, and he becomes known as the Sun King. He will become France's longest reigning monarch and preside over a period of rapid growth in France's overseas empire. This centralization of power in the hands of the king is exactly what Cardinal Richelieu had wanted to achieve during his lifetime, and now his protege, Cardinal Mazarin, has helped make it a reality. But other nations would follow suit, both centralizing their government administrations and adopting the principle of national sovereignty. And 
Through colonization and cultural osmosis, European people would spread these ideas throughout the world. Nowadays, almost every square mile of planet Earth is part of a nation-state. Most countries had nothing to do with the Thirty Years' War, yet here we are living in nation-states. Besides its political impact, the Thirty Years' War has an enormous effect on everyday people, especially throughout Germany. We've been spending the last few episodes talking about big historic events and battles and trends and what the leaders are up to, but there are millions of people on the ground at this time dealing with these events. The military casualties alone are horrendous, with overall losses of over a million men and possibly as many as two million, although it's worth noting that most of these died of disease, not from combat. Similarly, the civilian population of the Holy Roman Empire drops by somewhere between a third and a half over the course of the war. That is a drop of between five and nine million people, depending on who you ask. The main cause of civilian death was disease carried around by the armies, although famine was a major cause as well. It's also worth noting that a population decrease of five to nine million doesn't mean that five to nine million civilians died. A good portion of those people would have become refugees instead, but no matter how you cut it, millions of people have died and millions more have been displaced. Samuel Gardner writes of the destruction, quote, What a peace it was when it really came at last. Whatever life there was under that deadly blast of war had been attracted to the camps. The strong man who had lost his all turned soldier that he might be able to rob others in turn. The young girl who in better times would have passed on to a life of honorable wedlock with some youth who had been the companion of her childhood in the sports around the village fountain had turned aside, for very starvation, to a life of shame in the train of one or another of the armies by which her home had been made desolate. In the later years of the war, it was known that a body of 40,000 fighting men drew along with it a loathsome following of no less than 140,000 men, women, and children, contributing nothing to the efficiency of the army, and all of them living at the expense of the miserable peasants who still contrived to hold on to their ruined fields. If these were to live, they must steal what yet remained to be stolen. They must devour, with the insatiable hunger of locusts, what had remained to be devoured. And then, if sickness came, or wounds, and sickness was no infrequent visitor in those camps, what remained but misery or death? Nor was it much better with the soldiers themselves. No careful surgeons passed over the battlefield to save life or limb. No hospitals received the wounded to the tender nursing of loving, gentle hands. Recruits were to be bought cheaply, and it cost less to enroll a new soldier than to cure an old one. The losses of the civil population were almost incredible. In a certain district of Thuringia, which was probably better off than the greater part of Germany, there were, before the war cloud burst, 1,717 houses standing in 19 villages. In 1649, only 627 houses were left, and even of the houses which remained, many were untenanted. The 1,717 houses had been inhabited by 1,773 families. Only 316 families could be found to occupy the 627 houses. Property fared still worse. In the same district, 244 oxen alone remained of 1,402. Of 4,616 sheep, not one was left. Two centuries later, the losses thus suffered were scarcely recovered. And, as is always the case, the physical decline of the population was accompanied by moral decadence. 
men who had been accustomed to live by the strong arm, and men who had been accustomed to suffer all things from those who were strong, met one another, even in days of peace, without that mutual respect which forms the basis of well-ordered life. Courts were crowded with feather-brained soldiers whose highest ambition was to bedeck themselves in a splendid uniform, and to copy the latest fashion or folly which was in vogue at Paris or Versailles. In the country districts, a narrow-minded gentry, without knowledge or culture, domineered over all around, and strove to exact the uttermost farthing from the peasant in order to keep up the outward appearance of rank. The peasant, whose father had been bullied by marauding soldiers, dared not lift up his head against the exactions of the squire. The burden of the general impoverishment fell heavily upon his shoulders. The very pattern of the chairs on which he sat, of the vessels out of which he ate and drank, assumed a ruder appearance than they had borne before the war. In all ranks, life was meaner, poorer, harder than it had been at the beginning of the century. If much of all this was the result of the war, something was owing to causes antecedently at work. The German people in the beginning of the 17th century was plainly inferior to the German people in the beginning of the 16th century. During the whole course of the war, Maximilian of Bavaria was the only man of German birth who rose to eminence, and even he did not attain the first rank. The destinies of the land of Luther and Goethe, of Frederick II and Stein, were decided by a few men of foreign birth. Wallenstein was a Slavonian, Tilly a Walloon, Gustavus a Swede, Richelieu a Frenchman. The penalty borne by a race which was unable to control individual vigor within the limits of a large and fruitful national life was that individual vigor itself died out. We may well leave to those who like such tasks the work of piling up articles of accusation against this man or that, of discovering that the war was all the fault of Ferdinand, or all the fault of Frederick, as party feeling may lead them. Probably the most lenient judgment is also the truest one. With national and territorial institutions, the mere chaos which they were, an amount of political intelligence was needed to set them right, which would be rare in any country or in any age. As far as national institutions were concerned, the Thirty Years' War made a clean sweep in Germany. Nominally, it is true, emperor and empire still remained. Ferdinand III was still, according to his titles, head of all Christendom, if not of the whole human race. The diets still gathered to discuss the affairs of the empire. The imperial court, re-established on the principle of equality between the two religions, still met to dispense justice between the estates of the empire. But from these high-sounding names, all reality had fled. The rule over German men had passed for many a long day into the hands of the princes. It was for the princes to strive with one another, in peace or war, under the protection of foreign alliances. And by and by, half-consciously, half-unconsciously, to compete for the leadership of Germany by the intelligence and discipline which they were able to foster under their sway. When the days of this competition arrived, it was of inestimable advantage to Germany that, whatever else had been lost, Protestantism had been saved. Wherever Protestantism had firmly rooted itself, there sprang up in course of time a mighty race of intellectual giants. Goethe and Schiller, Lessing and Kant, Stein and Humboldt, with thousands more of names which have made German intellect a household word in the whole civilized world, sprung from Protestant Germany. When Bavaria, scarcely more than two generations ago, awoke to the consciousness that she had not more than the merest rudiments of education to give to her children, she had to apply to the Protestant North for teachers. For Germany in 1648, the worst was over. Physically, at least, she had no more to suffer. One page of her history was closed, and another had not yet been opened. She lay for a time in the insensibility of exhaustion. Unquote. And think about those people who were unlucky enough to be born in Germany in the year 1618. If they were lucky enough to live so long, their 
31st birthday would be the first one they would celebrate in peacetime. They would grow up, have children, and in these times, those children would already be adolescents. All of this would happen under the shadow of war. That's not one, but two generations growing up in a hellscape of disease, food shortages, and the constant risk of being pressed into service, raped, or having all your crops pillaged by the troops who are supposed to be defending your village. People talk a lot about emotional trauma these days. Sometimes that can be overblown, but I think if we're talking about emotional trauma, anyone would agree that this kind of life experience is the very definition. And here, at long last, we come to the end of the Thirty Years' War. And despite going on about it for four episodes, I've barely scratched the surface of a long and complex series of events. Despite trying to throw in some of the most important battles, there are some significant ones I had to entirely leave out because... If I got into enough detail, we could be wrapping up today with the Battle of White Mountain way back in 1620. But there are even major fronts to the war we haven't talked about. There's been fighting in northern Italy this entire time, and I think I've only mentioned it once. I haven't mentioned Russian involvement at all, or the shenanigans going on in Savoy and Switzerland. Transylvania only made a cameo appearance, like Poland. And... We've barely talked about the fighting between the Spanish and the Dutch unless it happened to relate what was going on in France and the Empire. So, I hope you can accept these last four episodes for what they're worth. My effort to tell the story in as clear a way as possible. And if all went as intended, then we've managed to keep things exciting as well. Most of all, I hope I've made clear how important these events are to the theme of this season. Nationalism. Without the Thirty Years' War and the Peace of Westphalia, the idea of national sovereignty might never have taken root. We might still have an international order based on overlapping, conflicting loyalties. The Thirty Years' War was many things. It marked the rise of France and the Netherlands as world powers. It marked the decline of Spain and the Holy Roman Empire. It was a period of great change in European military technology and tactics. It was a time of heroes and villains like Johann Sericles, the Count of Tilly, Albrecht von Wallenstein, the Prince de Condé, Emperor Ferdinand II, John George of Saxony, Frederick V of the Palatinate, Gustavus Adolphus, Leonard Tortenson, Louis XIII, Marie de Medici, Cardinal Richelieu, Louis XIV, and Cardinal Mazarin. Just to name a few of the players in our story. But most of all, the Thirty Years' War marked the beginning of the idea of modern nationalism. And that's why it's relevant. Guess who? It's me again, Dan. And I'm here just to tell you about a few things we're doing to expand the channel here at Relevant History. The first thing that we're doing is a series called Dan's War College. This is a series of exclusive videos from yours truly detailing various military battles and tactics in history and breaking down how they worked in a little more detail than we do here on the main show. If you're interested in that, it is a Patreon exclusive. The link for the Relevant History Patreon is in the description. And the monthly fee for the subscription is $5. 
And by the way, with that, you also get access to a private Discord chat room with yours truly. And yes, I take requests for those Patreon videos. Of course, not everybody is able to or wants to contribute financially, and that's just fine. I'm glad you're listening. But if you enjoy the show, why not share it with a friend? Help grow the audience and share something you love with somebody who might enjoy it. Also, it never hurts to leave a review. People are more likely to listen if they see a show with a bunch of reviews, particularly good ones, but eh, if you hated the show, go ahead and leave a review saying that, too. Tell me why you didn't like it. Alternatively, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. You can also reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com if you think that I've made an error in one of the episodes or you just wanted to say hello. Finally, to find all of my episodes with links to all the various subscription services and podcast feeds as well as my blog, which I have not updated in ages, but eh, you never know. You can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.